everyone. Welcome. It's a little warm, but we love it. <laughs> so now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Peter Henney. Peter is an associate professor of political science and director of Middle East Studies in the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Vermont. He is an expert on religion and politics, international conflict, and terrorism. He's the author of two books, Religious Appeals in Power Politics, Cornell University Press, 23, and Islamic Politics, Muslim States, and Counterterrorism Tensions, Cambridge University Press, 2017. He's also written numerous scholarly articles and appears frequently on Vermont and national media. Before, <laughs> we have music. Before, we, before coming to Vermont, Henny worked for over 10 years in Washington, D.C. on religious politics and counterterrorism. He has a PhD from Georgetown University and a BA from Vassar College. Please give a warm welcome to Peter Henny. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Uh, as you can hear, I've lost my voice. Okay. Part of my job, I, I never get a break from talking. So I've got tea and cough drops. Just be patient with me. Well, I'll, I'll talk as loud, loudly as I can. All right, so um, I looked back at my records from when we first started talking on this, and we'd emailed on October 5th of last year about this talk. <clears throat> and you know, so I gave this title sort of a filler. And then obviously two days later, there's the horrific attack on Israel by Hamas, and then Israel's attack on Gaza in retaliation. And I thought about redoing the talk, uh, to talk specifically on the war and what's going on, but I decided not to. Part of it is, you know, as I tell my students, Israel-Palestine is important, right? But it's not the only thing going on in the Middle East. Probably because we have this habit of chasing current events, which is, we, we need to know what's going on right now, but it's nice to take a step back and think more broadly. That's sort of what I'm going to do here. I'm going to start to think more broadly. Before, though, I, I want to just talk about uh, why the Middle East is, why the Middle East is so hard to talk about. Why do we run so many problems? And if you think about it, just in terms of your knowledge on something, varying on two dimensions, right? One is how much you know about something, a lot or a little. The other is your confidence in what you know. So an electrician knows a whole lot about electrical systems and is confident that they can fix my, my house. I know very little about electrical systems and I'm confident I'm, I'm not gonna try, right? I call the electrician. Some people know a lot and they're not very confident about that. You know, my daughter's learning how to ride a bike. She knows how to do it. She just, I have to push her, though, to get her to go. But then you have people who don't know a lot about a topic, but are very confident in their lack of in their, their opinions. And that's often the case in the Middle East. You know, so I, I was on WCX a couple years ago in the waiting room, and there's another woman there who's talking on something. And I said, oh, what are you talking on? And then she's, you know, told me I sat there and listened to what, what her expertise was. So how about you? And I was like, oh, I, I'm talking to the Middle East. And then I sat there, she told me what my expertise was, right? So people think they know a lot about it, and they, and they don't. Even me, like, I try to be humble. And that's sort of one of the takeaways, which I'll come back to at the end of the talk. Is okay. But so the topic here is, why is the Middle East, why will the Middle East always matter, right? Why will it always matter? And there's basically three ways. I'm going to go through each of the, with occasional breaks for my chamomile. All right, so the first is, basically it matters strategically and geopolitically. A lot going on there. Okay. There's geography. Some of the first civilizations in the world were here. Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians. This is kind of one of my pet areas of interest. I love you know, researching the ancient Middle East. The Greeks, the Byzantines, clashed with the Persian empires, Empire in the Important provinces of the Roman Empire were in the Middle East and North Africa. The later fell when Islam spread. There are important migration routes. So the Turks came out of Central Asia into Anatolia, what's now Turkey. 
the sort of crossroads. The Middle East was a source of many threats to Europe, from wars invading France and, and, and Spain, the Ottoman Empire right, moving into Southeast Europe. And then it was close to Europe, so it was an easy source for European aggression. Think the Crusades, colonialism under Napoleon, and then later colonialism under the French and the British. So just the geography matters a lot. And one of the first things we do in my class is learn the geography, why it matters, and I make them fill in all the countries on the map. Their least favorite assignment, but, but then they can say, look, I know where Morocco is, which you should know. So is that, geostrategically, you think during the Cold War, right, America, the Soviet Union, struggling for influence throughout the world, Middle East was a key battleground. Right, after World War II, British and French empires were crumbling. These countries were falling apart. Britain, especially, was just like, I can't deal with this anymore. Someone else take over. So America and the Soviets rushed in. America developed close ties with Israel, close ties with many of the conservative Islamic states, like Saudi Arabia and Jordan. Iran before the revolution in 79. Whereas the Soviet Union developed close ties with a lot of the more radical Arab states like Syria, Iraq. Other states like Egypt sort of bounced back and forth. They're initially in the middle, they moved more towards the Soviets later in the 60s, and then broke with the Soviets and went with America in the 70s. So this big source of geopolitical competition. Okay, oil, right? The oil's the obvious one. About half the world's oil reserves are in the region. If you look at where they're located, right, some of the biggest ones are Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Kuwait, the UAE. All countries that are the source of conflict, either now or in the past, or like the UAE, kind of a growing powerhouse in the region and around the world. And about 15 million barrels of oil are extracted daily from these big oil fields. It's also natural gas. Increasingly important source, relatively cleaner than, than oil. About a third of natural gas supply has come from the Middle East. Right? So a lot of what the world needs to run, it also matters politically. So initially what happened was, you know, the British, the French would come in, set up these pseudo-colonial controls over the oil supplies. They sort of rent them from uh, the people. People in the Middle East had very little control. Starting the 60s, we saw the formation of OPEC, right? Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, where these countries took control over their own oil, with the, the, the main powers being while Saudi Arabia. So politically, control over oil has been in the Middle East, even as supplies have diversified and shifted around. Like religion. I, I was talking the way. Very important story of religion. You know, Israel is the founding site of Judaism and Christianity. Islam, founded in what's now Saudi Arabia. Holy sites in Jerusalem and Baghdad. No. Important Christian holy sites throughout the Middle East and Turkey. Other smaller religions out here Zoroastrianism, Yazidis, related to Zoroastrianism. Remember a couple years ago they suffered a horrific genocide under their homeland. The main religions there, which is important, but where it gets tricky is that there's these overlapping sacred spaces. I think Jerusalem, right, holy site for Islam, uh, Christian Judaism. Normally when you have a conflict, you can like divide things up. You get this, you get that. You can't divide up could you write of Jerusalem? But no one wants to do it. These sacred spaces produce this indivisible conflict. It makes it very hard to extract yourself from any tension. It's just the general conflictual nature of international relations. Scholars talk about how different regions have different types of relations, some more peaceful than not. The Middle East is characterized by conflict. Not inevitably, it hasn't always been that case. It can change. 
think of Europe, right? Europe's horrific conflicts for hundreds of years. Now it's pretty peaceful in the Western part. What we see in the Middle East right, are these long standing rivalries between states. The Saudi Arabia and Iran, very tense relations, proxy battles going off since the 70s. Arab states and Israel since 48. And then earlier, we saw tense rivalries between Saudi Arabia and Egypt. We keep seeing these pop out that even if it doesn't rise to full scale war, there's constant tension. We see lots of civil war. I mentioned ISIS. Syria broke apart in a civil war, ISIS emerged. Civil wars in Lebanon. Also, terrorist groups like Al Qaeda, Bala, other types. Very prevalent and concentrated. There's also these interesting norms people have talk, talked about, how we're often in Middle East politics, you're expected to justify your policies by referring to common goals, right? Arab, Arab causes, religious causes. And then you're allowed to criticize other states if they don't live up to those standards. So especially in the 60s, this led to lots of problems. Someone like Jordan right, was constantly being attacked by other states for not being true defenders of Arab and Islamic causes. So all these things come together to make the Middle East really tricky. Nuclear weapons. Under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, right, there, are, there are five recognized nuclear states None of them in the Middle East, but we've got Iran, which is nuclear capable and probably close to becoming nuclear ready if they want. And Israel, which has a nuclear capability, they developed this decades ago. They kept it secret and ambiguous. They're going off guard, but, but haven't. So the fear is if a war breaks out between Iran and Israel, go nuclear. Or as tensions ratchet up, we can see what we call a nuclear cascade. So other states in the region will develop their own nuclear weapons programs to hold off these other threats. Saudi Arabia is a fear, Turkey. That element. So basically, to sum all this up, there's a whole lot of important stuff going on in the region. So what happens then when America tries to disengage from the region without thinking it through. You need suspense for a second. All right, what happens? Well, there's a couple of historical cases. Back in the 60s, LBJ, right, was involved in Vietnam, protests at home. He was also trying to manage relations with allies in the Middle East one being Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was locked in a proxy war with Egypt and Yemen, meaning they didn't fight each other directly, but a civil war had broken out with the Saudis supporting the royalists, royal family, and the Egypt, Egypt supporting the Republicans. They're trying to overthrow them and create a war. Many people call this Nasser's Vietnam. Nasser was the president of Egypt at the time. We got bogged down in this fighting. And so, with my recent book, I did some research at the LBJ Library. Lots of interesting cases of Saudi Arabia coming to America, coming to Johnson, look, we need your help, take on the Egyptians. Right, they're commies, they're going to spread Soviet influence, join up with us, we'll beat the communist threat. Johnson's advisors didn't quite buy it, and I think that was fair, because Nasser was not a communist, Egypt was not communist. And they're a little dismissive of, of, of Saudi Arabia. Just go away. Pat them on the head, they'll be okay. They didn't want to bother with the Middle East. The problem was, this war was in, the run up was 65, 66. What happens in 67? Right, the Six Day War. Massive war breaks out. Egypt, Jordan, Syria, again. America was sort of caught off guard. This desire to sort of pull ourselves back from the region left us unprepared to deal with a conflict when it This happened a lot later as well. So under President Obama, he in office wanting to break with George W. Bush, a different approach to the world. I think that was fair. 
But some of this involved getting us out of the Middle East, drawing down in Iraq, drawing down in Afghanistan, and then pivoting to Asia. And so East Asia, creating alliances there, dealing with China is the more important. And again, I think that's fair. Right? Emphasizing building up alliances, try to create this new um, Trans-Pacific Partnership, this new trade deal. And generally, out of Middle East affairs. Of course, what happened when Obama was president in the Middle East at the Arab Spring. A fruit vendor set himself on fire in Tunisia, response to corruption and despair of living in an authoritarian state. Protests broke out and spread throughout the region. We had no idea what was going on. Completely caught off guard. We sort of got involved where we were like half messages of democratic support. We backed an intervention in Libya to overthrow their dictator with no plan of what would happen afterwards. So Libya's been in a civil war since. I mentioned ISIS a couple times. ISIS emerged. President Obama said the fateful line about um, you don't send the LA Lakers against the JV team. Meaning this is just a bunch of losers. We don't have to worry about them. I always like to think whoever wrote that line for him got fired. Very wrong. Again, another case of us trying to get out of the region and we got Think now about a Biden. Going with Biden, similar impulse. Downplay the Middle East, don't get sucked in another endless war. Americans in general, I think we're tired of that. Fair. Pivoting to Asia. We have this AUKUS pact, pact with Australia and the UK. Give them uh, nuclear powered submarines, help stand up to China. Biden's building up his industrial policy to compete better with China. We had a big forum of East Asian states to strengthen alliances. And then again, Middle East is not really our problem. And so, again, really poor choice of words, Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, shortly before the October 7th attack, Middle East is pretty stable right now. Suddenly it blew up. And we what we see throughout, at least post-World War II history with America, is this desire to disengage from the Middle East because it's such a tricky region. Things fall apart and we get sucked back in without a real plan. Does that the reminder that it's always going to matter for these geo geopolitical and strategic reasons we can't forget about. It. Why I have a job. This is why my classes fill up. Good, for, but good but for bad reasons. That's reason one. Why the Middle East matters. Usually, if, you know, if you saw this title, well, the title was up before, and that's what I would say. I wasn't that surprising. But there's two other ways that I think the region always matters that we sometimes. All right, so that geostrategic importance, we ignore it, it blows up in our faces. The second one is that it matters, and it will always matter on its own terms. Matters on its own terms, not according to our priorities, not according to There's a great quote by uh, Lawrence of Arabia, memoirs, right, the British uh, military official who helped organize the Arab revolt against the Ottoman. Wonderful movie about him. I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said that when Westerners look at the desert, the Arabian desert, we just see emptiness. We see sand and dunes and you know, nothing there. And so we can impose what we want on it. But in reality, every dune, right, every oasis, is claimed and fought over by people who need to understand why they care, what they care about. And so there's this tendency uh, Old Orientalism, the West, we basically overgeneralize on in the Middle East. Assume it's kind of a fixed, unchanging, static region, and miss a lot of the dynamism. Something like democracy. Middle East lags behind the rest of the world in democracy. True. 
that led, led some to assume that it's impossible. Maybe the people in the region don't want democracy, their culture militates against it. That's actually not the case. The most polling finds that people want democracy. When they do have elections, they go out and vote, even if elections are not incredibly impactful. And it gets tricky, somewhere like Tunisia, right, where they had the closest to a real democratic state in the region, it fell apart. But the people weren't happy about that. They didn't embrace the end. More dynamism there. Economic growth. And the Middle East falls behind other regions in economic development, both in terms of just general economic output, but also human development, so literacy, education, women's rights. And so again, people think it's inevitable. There's something about the culture that prevents the region ever of catching up. This ignores, again, the reality and the dynamism. A lot of the slow growth is take control over the economy due to oil, which kind of saps the dynamism of society. And we've got really innovative states. Turkey, for a while in the early 2000s, a lot of entrepreneurs, massive investment, production. It suffered recently under their authoritarian. UAE, United Arab Emirates, right? authoritarian state, tricky legacy. But they're trying really hard to move away from just oil and, and diversify the economy. A lot going on. A peace, I mentioned, you know, it's a conflictual reason, region. People assume it's always going to be fight, always going to be conflict. But there's really long periods of peaceful coexistence between Muslims and A lot of what seems natural now is, is recent in historical terms. Forget about that. So basically, there's this failure to understand the reality of the region, people's own priorities, and that's going to affect U.S. foreign policy. So America has a long history of supporting authoritarian governments. I think the Shah of Iran, Saudi Arabia. And it, we, we justified it, you know, partly because of the Cold War. We've got to fight the Soviets, so we're going to work with whoever works. Again, I think that's fair. The Soviets were bad guys. But it often led to this assumption that this is what they wanted. You don't have to worry about pushing and democratizing the region. Not understanding that the details of economic growth have led us to not recognize the extent to which our Consumption of oil caused a lot of these problems. I mentioned oil contributing to the low economic growth. It seems weird. But what we found is that when a country relies on natural resources like oil, there's no need to develop the economy. Why start a business when the government just gives you a check? If women don't get a chance to work outside of the home, factories, everything's and the people don't really press the government for change because they're easily bought off. So Saudi Arabia faces protests, they increase subsidies, protests die down. And so we can see some specific policies here, right? Think back to George W. Bush. He and, and the new conservatives in his administration, this was a big break in terms of accepting authoritarianism. If you look at their 2002 national security strategy, they recognized that one of the big drivers of terrorism was lack of freedom. And so there was a famous exchange between Condoleezza Rice, one of his top advisors, Brent Scowcroft, served in George H.W. Bush's ministry, and actually was Condoleezza Rice's mentor. And she was pressing him on, you know, why do we have decades and decades supporting undemocratic states. He's like, well, it's because of stability. He's like, well, look what it's produced. It's produced 9-11. So that was good. But we didn't think through what the Middle Eastern people wanted, how to gain democracy, right? So Bush spread democracy by invading Iraq. Hope to. Now, I remember this. This is my sophomore year of college. Right? We were promised that they would greet us with flowers and 
hearing as we went happened. Anyone who'd really studied the country would understand that. That was a sudden invading force, not, it wasn't like World War II. Think about Donald Trump, right? Thinks of himself as this deal maker. Like that's how he kind of justifies his, his presidency, his value to America. He wanted to do that in the Middle East. We have this big deal, the Abraham Accords, where we normalized relations between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, other states came along. This was actually a big deal. You know, a lot of my left-leaning friends in, in academia were critical of it. I was like, no, important deal. But it's not going to solve the deeper problems in the Middle East because it sidestepped the Palestinian issue. Basically, this desire to have a big deal, where we focus on our priorities, getting the deal, rather than the local priorities, which is Palestine, and led to these long summary issues experiencing now. Also, think about Trump, right? Uh, we had troops along the border between Syria and Turkey. They were working with the Kurds to fight ISIS. Turkey does not like the Kurds because the Kurds have been waging an insurgency against Turkey. And so basically, Turkey convinced Trump to move the U.S. troops so they could launch an offensive. This angered many people. Some of Trump's top advisors left, seeing as violating, turning against our allies. But one of the defense that came from Trump, and to be fair, a lot of people say this, they believe in fighting for hundreds of years. What am I supposed to do about it? But again, we miss the fact that's not really the case. There was long periods of So here, the Middle East matters in that there's this depth and complexity. Excuse me. This depth and complexity, people should have a say over what happens to them. The problem is, when we formulate our policies, we don't know about that. We try to impose what we want on them, and badly for them and us. All right, third way matters. Now, and up to now, it's been sort of maybe like a standard left of center liberal professor. Um, this is where I'm going to be challenging the other side. The concerns I have with the left. So basically, Western observers and activists who see themselves as championing the region often try to impose our own values, our own struggles on the region via our activism. Again, ignoring what's going on. Basically, it, it, it's well-meaning desire to help. But in this desire to help without really understanding the reality on the ground, we're also guilty of telling the region what it wants. Ignoring the reality, ignoring what they're trying to accomplish. Themselves. So just a couple examples. Saddam Hussein. My students have no idea who this is. I have to explain it. I'm assuming, right, dictator of Iraq, <clears throat> horrific guy, massacred his own people, invaded Kuwait, uh, had a weird around the world. I actually have a copy of a sunglasses ad he was in. Because you remember he had the big mustache, the, the cool aviator sunglasses. He had this sort of like, Machismo gravitas. And so Kanan Makia, who is a um, Iraqi intellectual, was critical in the 90s of this moral relativism that prevented so many Western liberals from criticizing Saddam Hussein. Like, yeah, he's an anti-imperialist, but he's a dictator. Just say it. I remember this from college. I was in college early 2000s. And some of my activist friends marched in support of him. And I was like, so I'm against the Iraq war, too, but not, I'm not defending some Hussein. That's not what we're doing. But some people were. Like, they would have, like, pro -suit. And this thing, yeah, 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 I think we should have avoided the Iraq war and opposed it. 
but not go to the extreme of downplaying what this guy did. More recent examples. The Houthis in Yemen. This is a group that has been there basically fighting a civil war against the government decades at this point. <clears throat> Mostly ignored. People know about them now because they've been launching missiles tipping the Red Sea in protest of it. Uh, and, you know, it's tricky, right? And I, I've read a lot on this when no one else cared. Um, they have legitimate complaints, right? They've been repressed by their government. Their leader was assassinated. The Saudis have launched a brutal war against Yemen to fight them, causing famine, destroying hospitals, things like that. Bernie Sanders was one of the few people in the Senate who would actually try to do something about this. I appreciate it. But they're not nice guys. They're not nice guys. Their, their slogan includes like death to Jews, destruction of Israel, death to America. They're horribly repressive. There's reports of torture in areas they control. They force women to cover and stay in the house if not they want to. They repress Christians, Jewish people, others, religious minorities. And so I was always like, you know, stop the, the war on the Houthis, but I'm not going to defend them. But I noticed recently that they've become this big pet cause of a lot of the left. Because they're seen as this anti-imperialist force. And so I write for, a, I edit for an international relations blog, and I wrote something like, I can't believe I need to explain the Houthis are not nice people. And I've read a lot of controversial stuff. I work on Israel, Middle East, you know. Um, and this was like the most controversial thing I've ever written. People went, you thought I would strangle a puppy in front of them because I explained why this group of, of guys were not nice. And that we should, again, oppose the war on them. U.S. airstrikes might not do much, but we don't need to defend them. But I think people only saw them through the lens of anti-imperialism and missed what was really going on and ignored the suffering of the Yemeni people under them. That's not controversial enough, let's talk about Hamas. Right, so a lot of the activism we're seeing is in support of the Palestinians, and I think that's fair. Uh, I think Israel had a right to defend itself, but I also am very concerned about death toll in Gaza Strip, famine, etc. But some of the activism crosses the line into defending Hamas. There's the chance of the from the river to the sea, which they did not come up with initially, but they've adopted. Some people have used hang gliders in their uh, protest posters, which is one of the ways that Hamas got into Israel and massacred. I think it's fair to say some people are defending Hamas. Now, Hamas, it's just, pulling is hard right in the war, but right now Palestinians um, in Gaza, about 42% of them support Hamas and 44 of them in the West Bank support Hamas. As you can say, look, you know, it's not a majority, but maybe they do represent the people. But these basically went up dramatically after the war started. Right, so, especially in the West Bank, there's only 12% of people in the West Bank back to Hamas. But really, I think a lot of the support for Hamas we're seeing is anger at the war, anger at Israel's war in Gaza. And it makes sense that people Palestinians are not huge fans of Hamas because they're not nice guys, again. Right? There's a lot of misrule. A lot of the aid that gets to them never gets to the people. The economy is sort of falling apart under Gaza even before war. Palestinian Christians, right? a lot of Palestinian Christians basically living in fear. There, there's an article in Christianity Today, an evangelical magazine about they don't know if it's better to go north and deal with Israel, or go south and deal with Hamas. Right? Because Hamas has not treated them well. Um, Amnesty International has talked about a general climate of repression following a brutal crackdown in the Gaza Strip when Hamas took over. 
They've banned LGBT rights. They've gone after labor unions. And so I struggle, struggle to defend Hamas, right? I think people think they're defending the Palestinians by being supportive of Hamas and its, and its conflict, combat. But by doing so, we're ignoring the suffering of the Palestinians under Hamas, even as they're also suffering under Israel. One more, maybe less controversial, um, peace, right? A lot of people in America are giving up on peace. There's foreign affairs has uh, good uh, debates about is the two-state solution done? Is peace impossible? And I think we're skeptical of that, right? We, we, we get angry about it. How could they not be angry about it? And sure, like a Camp David III or the next Oslo might never happen. But there's a whole lot of small-scale ground level initiatives happening that we don't realize. Right, there's a, um, an experimental community called Wahat al-Salam or Nev Shalom, where Arab and Jewish Israelis live together peacefully, take classes together. Um, the Haifa Laboratory for Religious Studies is a program where they bring together people of different faiths, have them work together, study together. I've done some work with them. I've interfaith pronouncements. There's this Blickel Institute for Interfaith Dialogue that brings together Jewish and Muslim voices for peace. Have them you know, reach out to their community, say, look, you know, we can work together. There's been many cases of women's groups, both sides, kind of sitting down together, holding protests together in favor of peace. We don't notice this. Because again, it's not dramatic. It's not capturing the news, but it's happening. It's happening all over. And my fear is that we get so despondent and maybe even complacent right, that peace will never happen. If we're so uh, upset about it, how could they not be upset about it? We're going to miss the reality that peace is possible. It's just a different type of peace. So the region matters in this sense that we need to listen to people in the region. Right? And that we should engage with the region, go out and protest. You know, tell my students, if you want to get angry, get angry. Right After you leave my classroom, Angry, go on protests, use this knowledge, but just know the reality of what's going on. It's very complex. Another thing I tell them if anyone gives you a simple answer to anything on the Middle East, they're wrong. So again, Palestinians are suffering, but I'm not going to defend Hamas. Right? The next peace process is not going to happen at Camp David, but peace will still happen if we support these low, local, small scale voices that are working on it. All right, so just wrapping up the last couple minutes, and again, back to my different dimensions of knowledge. I mean, a lot of Americans just think we know more about the Middle East than we do, don't recognize the complexity. And this is even me. I, I have to keep going back and reading new books from different perspectives to make sure what I'm saying is actually right. Because it's easy to hear something and roll with it. And then we end up thinking we know what's best for it. And this is our leaders and ourselves as well. We don't realize our, our uncertainty and the extent to which we're imposing our own values. On them. So not everyone can be an expert on the Middle East. Like, this is literally what I do every day. You know, like the electrician becomes an expert in electricity, I have to read about the Middle East. But there are things we can do to, to, to be more constructive, right? It's just try to read broadly. So we had a talk on Israel at, at UVM the other day uh, by a guy who just wrote a book on Israel's Declaration of Independence. And then someone said, what, can you recommend any Palestinian authors? And he talked about kind of a Palestinian perspective. So if you have time, right, read an Israeli book, read a Palestinian book. Read The Economist, which I think is a good, pretty good, different views. Don't trust anything you see on Facebook or Twitter. I'm not going to call it X, Twitter, whatever social media you might use. Because when people say things, and it just rolls with it. And even academics do this. It's a little embarrassing how quickly we run with something that fits our priors. If you're supportive of Israel, and you see something Hamas did, you're like, aha, without checking, and vice versa. Let's just be compassionate. Someone said, you know, back in the fall, that whenever you talk to the Middle East, you should imagine that there's an Israeli who lost someone in the attack, and a Palestinian who's waiting to hear if their family is alive. And think, 
would I still be saying what I'm saying right now if that was the case? I think so, but, but it's a check on, on going too far off the rails. I think it's just, again, way back to the beginning of the talk, humility, just recognizing what we know and we don't know. And this is, again, academics are 100% guilty of this. Everyone's guilty of it. Um, and just recognize if someone says something you don't re realize, okay, let's, like, let's think about it. Let's try to learn. And if they're wrong, then we can explain later. But, but humility is kind of a good starting point for that. All right, I made it through without completely breaking down. So thanks for your patience. And uh, that's the end of my talk. Fabulous. Very informative, my goodness. Um, I'll turn on the lights and I see Norman, you have a question, I'll be right there. <laughs> Thank you. You've brought out quite well the complexities of the area. I was wondering, this is kind of a theoretical question. After the death of Muhammad, we had a split with the Sunni Shia. If that had never occurred, how much difference might this have made in the Middle East? Um, that's a little tricky, right? So I, it is. Um, So it depends what you think really drives things. Is it like doctrinal differences or is it politics? And even among the Sunnis, we did have fights over who would be the next caliph, different dynasties taking over. So I think we still have some of the same divisions we've seen. Um, more recently, there's been some interesting work arguing like the, the Shia in Iraq and Iran have this uh, extra sort of organizing capabilities. And that might have been related to the Shia faith because it's more hierarchical. But I think we still see, and there'd still be, see, we'd still have issues. People will find a way to fight, even if there's not a big religious division. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? No. There we go. Uh, so you said that um, peace in the Middle East is possible, but it's a different kind of peace. Could you elaborate on that, please? Sure. So this is like you know Trump with the Abraham Accords. Obama had his has peace plan. Bush had the roadmap for peace. Clinton had Camp David II. H. W. Bush had Oslo. Johnson had his fifteen points. And every American president wants like to be the one have the big grand peace plan that resolves everything. And I just don't, I don't know if that would ever happen, but especially it won't happen now because it's so hard to get like the leadership on the board on, side, on, board on each side. But if you can build up like, you know, uh, Israelis and Palestinians interact with each other, building up small scale trust that way. One of my colleagues who works at Bar Elon University in Israel says, you know, her Arab and Israeli students never have a problem with each other. And that's sort of 1% at a time, building trust, building compassion. Um, you know, it's not going to completely transform the region, but I think it can maybe create a little space for understanding. It's harder to measure that, though, but I think that's the point. Hi. Hello. Thank you. Um, do you. There's a lot of pressure on Biden right now to to more seriously threaten withholding uh, offensive arms in order to pressure Netanyahu to um, announce a ceasefire or at least allow more humanitarian aid into Gaza um, and maybe not invade Rafa. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that, on those, uh, that pressure? Do you think Biden should comply? Yeah, so I was actually on WCX when Welch and Sanders released their letter and I don't think you should. I think we need to put more pressure on Netanyahu. Netanyahu is a, a horrible leader uh, for both Israelis and Palestinians. But he's an incredibly smart leader who will find a way to survive. And if we cut him off, what leverage do we have anymore, right? That actually might, that actually might increase his domestic supports. Like, look, the Americans are against us. I will keep you safe. 
And I think what we've been doing, like Blinken, Secretary of State, has been this very quiet, careful diplomacy, shuttling back and forth. And it's been effective. We're seeing, you know, they, they seem to have held off on Rafa. They, they keep talking about letting more aid in. And it's not a big, dramatic, sudden shift, but I think it's going to get us closer. Whereas it might feel satisfying to be like, just forget it, we're done. But it's not going to give us what we want or what the Palestinians. From a political science standpoint, uh, uh, I think back to during the George W. Bush uh, administration, they didn't want to get involved in nation building, but they were doing exactly that. They were trying to make uh, former dictatorships into democracies. And I'm wondering what kind of a transition government might some of these countries in the Middle East, either kingdoms or religious-led countries uh, or dictatorships, uh, what, what kind of a, a, a form of government might be a transition government before putting them into a, a, a Republican or a Democratic type of government? Um, yeah, so actually one of my professors at Georgetown wrote a book on military occupations when they work. And they don't often. But it's basically, you know, when the country's been completely beaten down and destroyed, and everyone's like, enough, just take over. And so like Germany after World War II, right? And I don't think we're willing to do that. Either, I don't know, in terms of killing that many people or just investing that many resources. Um, and so where it's going to come is maybe more organically. Do you think somewhere like Saudi Arabia, there's this guy, Mohammed bin Salman, who's the crown prince, basically running the country. Saying a lot of nice things about, you know, you know, women can drive now and opening movie theaters, while also maintaining control. And the hope maybe is that we can engage with them in that sense, like nudge them a little bit in the right direction, and maybe have somewhere like Jordan or Morocco, where it, it's um, still an authoritarian state, but there are elections, there is a parliament, the king is more constrained in power, and so more gradual. I don't think, you know, we can't just get rid of a dictator and fix it. A Zoom question. Okay. Can you provide the information about the small positive projects we can support with Triple E to distribute to members or repeat it? Um, yeah, so I don't actually know how we can help here besides everyone supporting it. But right, there's... Um, uh, I mean, I think one thing is, you know, I mentioned that, and after you do links, I can send out links afterwards. It's just recognizing they exist, right? So the Haifa Laboratory for Religious Studies, check it out, you know, Google it. They do a lot of really interesting work. Um, this, uh, um, you know, that Wahad al-Salam, you look, that, we'll have to send this spelling out, but ABC did a, a news report on it. So just spreading awareness, I think. I know, uh, I'm an Episcopalian, and one of the priests, Church has worked with an interfaith Christian group in the West Bank or, or in the Gaza Strip. So there's a lot of interfaith groups working in that sense. You can find some of them. A lot of Christian churches connect with that because of the, the uh, strong history of Palestinian Christianity. Um, see, I, I, don't, I wouldn't know which one to endorse as one to like, give money to, but just look for them and spread awareness. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, I, I know much too little about the area, but I'm curious about Egypt's role. Uh, they share a border with Gaza, and is there are there border issues there with the or with immigrants? I mean, are the refugees? What exactly is happening between Egypt and Israel at this point? Yeah, it's um, tricky, Egypt, because <coughs> they actually conquered the Gaza Strip. 48. That was meant to be Palestinians. Egypt said, nope, that's ours. But then Israel took it from them in 67, um, and there was wars. But Israel and Egypt have a peace treaty. And as part of the deal, Egypt basically manages the Palestinians from their side. And so there's obviously real issues with Israel blockading Gaza Strip, but Egypt has just as many issues, not letting aid in, not letting people cross the border. Because Egypt does not want a sudden exodus of people. 
Um, and so I tell my students a lot, like, you know, we criticize Israel for its treatment of Palestinians, but criticize every Arab state as well. None of them really care. Jordan, I think, maybe cares a little, but not, none of them are doing much. And Egypt is one of them. Anyone else? Questions? Good. I know nothing, too, but why are all of the... Arab states so recalcitrant about Palestinians. Um, yeah, that's a good question, right? So after '48, Palestinians from what is now Israel uh, were expelled or fled, both basically, uh, and ended up in, in Arab states, and they didn't give them citizenship. And there's debates about that. You know, Jordan, as I said, did try to take care of them. But what happened was the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, basically set up terrorist camps in Jordan to fight Israel, but also fought the Jordan, Jordanian king. And so Jordan went in and wiped them out. And so I, there's a security threat as part of it. Um, part of it is 67. Like, they did try to take care, of Israel, take care of Israel, like defeat Israel. And they lost embarrassingly badly. And I think they just wanted to turn elsewhere for their own prestige. So yeah, I think it's just, they recognize it's just a hard, tricky issue. Um, but some are. So again, you know, Jordan, as the country that used to control the West Bank and East Jerusalem with the, the, the Temple Mount, the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, has often seen itself as a defender of the Palestinians. I think the current King Abdullah still tries to. Saudi Arabia, for all its faults, is working on this. Like, there's a peace deal where Palestinians get a state, then we'll recognize Israel. So there's some of that, but, but Saudi Arabia is also more removed than Egypt is. So it's easier for Saudi Arabia to get involved. Well, this is a little more of a political question, but in terms of we understand what the administration is trying to do in terms of the Secretary of State, but I wonder within Congress, if you recognize any particular committees or leadership that in Congress that are making sense to you and under, seem to have a good ungrasp of the situation. Um, Putting you on the spot, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, as you probably guessed from my, you know, talk, I'm like, I guess a liberal, although a lot of people around here think I'm conservative. So I'm not a fan of the, the squad and the, the far left approach this, for the, like cutting off military aid. I think what Chuck Schumer did was encouraging. <clears throat> Long-standing defender of Israel, finally saying enough is enough, then Yahoo, you are the problem, time for you to go. That was a big act of courage and could be effective. In terms of um, constructive policies, you know, I don't know. I mean, the idea of pairing Israel aid with Ukraine aid seems good in theory. Because Republicans tend to support aid for Israel, and then Democrats, for some reason, I don't know why Republicans aren't, but Democrats are more supportive of aiding Ukraine. But that's falling apart because of issues among the Republicans. Oh, coming. I just heard um, on the radio, VPR, or NPR, um, that if we gave the Palestinians hope of, the, of really be able, being able to have their own state, if that should happen, then maybe Hamas wouldn't have such control. Will this ever happen? Um, well, so it's tricky, right, because the Oslo process in the early 90s started the process towards creating a Palestinian state. Yeah. Uh, created for the first time Palestinian authority, some self-rule. It was meant to be the first state step towards an actual statehood. And then the Palestinian Arafat, the head of the PLO, recognized Israel. And then Hamas responded by launching suicide attacks against Israel. So 
I don't think Hamas would give up, but I think people would be less supportive of Hamas, right, if there is an alternative. Um, the fear, though, is just we're so far down this, you know, this downward spiral, this quagmire, where how, how do we ever see ourselves way out? And a lot of the issue is leadership on the Palestinian side. I don't want Hamas in charge. Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority, is also not a great leader. He's like, the joke is he's in his like 15th year of his four-year term. He just stays in power. Um, and so the Palestinians need to support like the next generation of leadership, which is also hard under Israeli control. There's a whole lot of things to buy apart. Yeah, I think a lot of the support from Hamas is due to the occupation. But I don't think Hamas would give up if, if they got second state solution. Um, I don't know if they're approving. It's hard, you know, because if you, you got Hamas fighters around, you're not going to like, hey, come on, don't do that. Um, <laughs> but they stop. I don't think the Palestinian people could stop it. I mean, the Hamas, they're just much more heavily armed. In terms of how they got built, I mean, some, people, some of the argument is that it was aid that goes to the Gaza Strip meant for construction, and the Hamas just took it, used it for tunnels. Iran has been funding Hamas a lot. And so um, that's how it happened. And we, like, Israel knew it was, they were there. America knew they were there. I just don't think the Palestinian people had much of an option to do that. It's hard to rise up against someone like that. Peter, this has been terrific. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>